we're looking at protocols. So today's data, just three quick images that are zoomed in. I'll pause, you can have a little think about what they are. On the left, you've got an ethernet connect, uh, cable. This is particularly the connector. The middle is the image of a hard drive, hard disk drive, the magnetic storage. And on the right hand side, you've got a USB um, stick zoomed in on the sort of connector that goes into the PC. Specification content. So today with the protocols, we're looking at the main protocols um, that you'll come across and use within computing. So we've got the TCP IP, HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, POP or POP, IMAP, and SMTP. And then we also need to be aware of, the con of what layers are in their concepts. I won't go through requirements, I'll allow you to read through those on your own. So first of all, it's worth explaining what a protocol is. Now a protocol is a rule or a set of rules as such that govern how computers communicate on a network. If you think of it in the way that when you communicate and interact with other human beings, there are set rules that you have agreed that you don't necessarily discuss, but you know exist. So for example, if you're talking to one of your peers in the class, you'll both use the English language, for example. You'll both know that you'll use certain um, slang terms or certain sort of local phrases that obviously each of you understand, and that's an agreement in that communication. And computers are the same. They have these different rules that exist for different purposes. So whether it be things like sending emails, uploading files, websites, and so forth, they have these agreed rules so that every device from every manufacturer can communicate with each other in the same sort of way. And this is why when you go to, for example, a website, it appears exactly the same on an Apple product as what it would on, for example, a Microsoft product, on an Asus, an Acer, whoever, okay? So it's a case that these rules exist to enable sort of a standard method of communication. There are a range of different protocols that you need to learn and we'll go through each of these looking at them individually so that you can sort of have, get a feel for them. Now there isn't a trick with these, it is a case obviously of just becoming familiar with them and revisiting them over the duration, but some of these you may be aware of or even familiar with already. So TCP IVP video, there's a video here and I'll leave this in the PowerPoint so you can play it that will go through and give you kind of a breakdown as to how TCP IP works. But I have given an explanation here. I'll summarize it and then I'll give you a chance to watch the video and read through this uh, in your own time. So basically the TCP IP model is the transmission control protocol and the internet protocol model. So the internet protocol, the IP addresses we've studied before, those series of numbers that locate where you are in a network. And the TCP, the transmission control protocols, about how our data gets transmitted across a network. So this is where we're saying about our data gets um, sent across and there's a procedure that follows in, in these four sort of layers. Now I'll give you a kind of a summary of these. So when we send data from one place on a network to another, it doesn't just get sent as one lump. So if we were sending, for example, a photo, that photo would get broken down into lots and lots of tiny little pieces called packets. So a one, one photo can get broken down into millions and millions of tiny little bits of data that will get sent across the net network. Now these packets of data have certain things added to them so they know where they're going. So a packet of data, one tiny fragment of that photo will have an IP address associated with it. And that IP address will be where it's come from and where it's going to. You'll also find that it will have some data to say what application it's been used in. So for example, if it was um, an email or if it was a website or if it was a file that's been uploaded, there'll be some markers within that packet to say so. You'll also have the order of where that packet sits in the file so that when the person receiving it at the other end knows, uh, when they receive it, they know where it goes in the string of binary data. If you think of it like your photo being broken down into tiny little puzzle pieces and each one of those puzzle pieces are being sent across one by one, you've got the sender's address and the receiver's address, you've got where in the puzzle it fits, along with how it's being transmitted and what application it is that it's got to be used. Now, each one of these layers gets um, applied to these packets of data as we're sending it. And then when it's received, those layers kind of almost get peeled back and put back together to the original when it's received. Now, these layers work in a number of ways, and we'll talk about how and why we use layers in a moment. But I think it's worthwhile just engaging with the video, reading through this content, not getting too hard on the technicals of it, um, but ultimately just being aware of that packets get broken down and how, how the basics of it getting transferred across. So layers themselves, that we refer to them as being self-contained. And what we mean by that is that each of those layers in that process are independent of each other. However, they still rely on each other to, for the whole process. 
it means that you could remove one of those layers, update it, edit it, and then put it back in, and it wouldn't have an impact on the functionality of the other layers. And this means, obviously, that we can start to uh, move forward and progress and update computer science technologies without affecting that process. But what it also means that if, is if there's a problem within our communication on a network, we can isolate it to one sort of fixed point rather than an entire system. Other protocols than HTTP. HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and this is the set of rules around how websites are transmitted. So HT is standing for Hypertext. HTML is Hypertext Markup Language. It's the language that our websites are, are, are created with. And it means that when we go onto our web browsers and we type in a website address and we go to that web server, that web server serves us or sends us back the website, it displays in our computer in a set way. And this, as I mentioned already, is how obviously all websites are displayed in the same way on the same devices. They use this set of rules. There's a follow-up to HTTP and that's HTTPS, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. And as I say, it's pretty much the same as HTTP with the addition of that secure element. And the secure element is achieved by encrypting the data that is transmitted across the network. So when we're encrypting the data, we're scrambling the data up so it can't, make, can't be understood by anyone. Now, it might well be that that data still gets intercepted, but with it being encrypted, it means that there's no chance of anyone being able to read it and make sense of it. Okay, the key thing is they can still read it, but it's making sense of it um, and therefore rendering it useless. And this might be the sort of thing that you'll use if you're doing online banking, logging into any of your accounts and profiles, then HTTPS is going to be the protocol you'll be using. FTP, File Transfer Protocol. Now, this is used when we're sending or uploading files to the internet, equally when we're downloading. Now, this is where we're transferring files from our clients to our servers, and it's the set of rules that govern how those files get uploaded. So when you're uploading, for example, a video to YouTube or attaching a file to an email, uploading to your Google Drive, all of these things are using the FTP protocol. POP, Post Office Protocol. This is a set of rules around emails, and this in particular is how emails are retrieved. Now, what we've got with POP is that when an email is retrieved, it is deleted from the server. So if you access your Gmail, for example, using the POP protocol, it would then delete it from the Gmail server and just save it on the computer that you've downloaded, which means obviously there's only sort of one instance of that email at any time. IMAP, IMAP actually is slightly more modern than POP. It's used again in retrieving emails. However, the key difference with IMAP is the fact that when you uh, download your email, it still leaves it on the server, so it won't delete it. So if you access your Gmail and download your emails to your computer, it doesn't delete it from your Gmail account. It still remains on the server. SMTP, quite straightforward. It's used when emails are sent. There's nothing more to it than that. 